Now, you recently wrote an article about how a lot of investors will actually miss the opportunity in precious metals going forward. And I think it's important to always kind of be contrarian in some view where you know, we might be hearing certain things from the mainstream media that, oh, this is the time to buy or this is the time to sell. But we have to often think for ourselves as investors uh, moving forward. And a couple of the points that you made were that um, as precious metals take off, um, we may hear a lot of people wanting to take profit at that time. Your perspective on that, some of the reasons why investors will miss the opportunity to take advantage of the coming upside in precious metals? I think it has to do with a couple of things that have already happened. Uh, that, and I can understand why investors would feel this way. But again, like you say, you have to go against your own emotions sometimes. But uh, you look at 2016, we had a six month you know, barn burner rally there in the metals and miners. And then it was all given back over the next 18 months. And then about 2018 into 2020, 2021, we had all-time new highs in gold and a strong silver market. And so people are, you know, they've seen this and it's human nature. They go, well, is this going to be another one of the same thing? And we don't know. But if you start selling right away, oh, I've got a, I've got a decent profit here. Uh, then if it really becomes the real deal, which I think we're getting closer to all the time, you may not have much of a position left. And so would you do you want to sell at twenty seven dollars silver and say it go to forty four and have a third of what you had? You know, I think selling some is important, but uh, maybe one of the things that helps me is if I want to buy or sell, I tend to figure out an amount I'd like to sell or buy and then do half of that. And that takes some of my emotions out of the game because if I'm emotional about it, I might do too much. I might accumulate too much at one spot or sell too much at one spot. And this way, because many people have waited as I have uh, for many years for this, they're doing some buying and selling, but basically accumulating. And why accumulate and put all that time in? And then when we're fairly close to the cusp of something like a one-time event happening in silver, which I believe is on the way, have a fraction of what you had saved up over all those years because you, you, know, you got back to the green and you took a profit and then you saw it go on and on and on and you have a small amount. So there's a price to pay for that as well. There are some key levels that people are looking for, for example, silver to break the $30 level uh, to really signal that we are uh, gonna have this next leg up. You mentioned in the article that people will have recency bias uh, before this breakout occurs. Can you expand on that? Well, just like we were talking before that these things always fail. It goes up to 30, 32, it's going to go back. Now, it might go to 32 and then drop to 29 and shake out a lot of people and then go back to 36, you know. So if, it, if it's for real, that's the sort of thing it's going to do. Another thing aligned with this concept is the idea of support and resistance levels. And I make a distinction between a linear advance, which is what you see in most bull markets and even impulse legs, where there's a fairly steady 45-degree angle approach, uh, you know, increase in prices over time. And you can get on to that and add more and take some profits. That's a linear advance. And it's, it's kind of predictable in a way, assuming that the, the move continues. But then there's an exponential advance when instead of a 45 degree angle, it starts moving to the 60 or 70 degrees. And that's approaching a blow off phase. And exponential moves cannot be predicted, predicted easily. Support and resistance don't generally uh, hold on the chart. So if you sell at the first or second resistance level, it'll just shoot that, through that like a knife through butter. And that's what happened in 2016. And I believe it'll happen in a major, major way when we finally get that big move that we've all been looking for, it's going to take out charts that look like they're resistance levels on the chart, just like standing still. And, uh, you know, when silver is going to rise $5 a day, that's going to take out a lot of, a lot of resistance levels. No, I can definitely already see people commenting right now of like, you know, well, silver's at 22 right now, or it's actually, as we speak, uh, dipping below 22 right now. So it seems like, you know, this hasn't happened yet. We're, we've been talking about this for so long and silver hasn't broken out. Your perspective on some of the signs we should be looking for to show that, yes, actually this time is different uh, before we see this breakout. 
we will be looking for a low volume drop uh, in, out of support and a turnaround. Uh, one of the things I like to look for, which is very seldom seen in the liquid market, is a one or two day island reversal where prices drop with no trading on a particular day. The next day they're lower and there's a gap on the way down. And then a day or two later, the same thing happens on the way up and it creates an island where no trading took place on a certain place on the way down or up. Those happen very seldom. But if I see that in the physical market or in certain stocks that have a lot of liquidity, to me, that is a tremendous indicator. And I want to pay attention to that because if that is not violated or the gaps filled within a few days, that gap could last for months or even years. And I want to honor that until it's either proven or disproven. And it will then generally be proven or disproven within a short time. So that's, that's one thing I look for. So it's a low volume in those price ranges. Why, why is that a bullish factor? Well, it could be a high volume in the selling that led to the island. But just let's say it, it's 22 and it drops to 21.20. doesn't create an island and comes back up the next day or so. But on the drop to 21.20, maybe the volume was a third of what you'd been seeing or a half. That's, that's, that's an indicator that the selling is waning and, and people are waiting to get in and buy. And so the, the strong money, the strong hands are in there buying that selling pressure. But if you see a, a big volume day, that may indicate further downside ahead. And these are things that are never guarantees. They're, they're playing the odds. But they are playing the odds in a way that can end up in your favor if you know how to interpret them and if you can keep your emotions under control. Now, you mentioned in the article that also silver typically lags gold. So how should we be expecting that in the next leg up? Gold may lead. It doesn't always lead, but it may lead. And it may be uh, a little more aggressive than silver. And silver may sit there for a while, and then all of a sudden you'll see a big jump, a dollar ten, on the upside, you know. And this will happen throughout the move. And when it really gets underway, which I was a participant uh, along with David Morgan and others, we didn't know each other then, but we were participants in the physical market and the futures market in 1979. You would see sometimes gold would move strongly for two weeks and silver would hardly budge. And you go, what's going on? Well, nothing's going on. Gold and silver are very closely correlated as high as 90 percent, but not on a day to day basis. And then all of a sudden, after a week or two, suddenly silver would be up six dollars. So that's the sort of thing you have to trust in that the, the market has kind of got the, the Janus doors, so to speak. The Romans talk about the two doors that open you know, each way. So that's something to consider. And keep that in your bag of tools so when you see it, you'll understand that the meaning it may have. Now, one of the interesting points that you mentioned in the article has nothing to do with technical analysis. It, it has more to do with really making sure that the silver that you think you own, you actually do own. And when investing in silver, there's a, quite a few different ways to invest in silver. You can invest in the physical metal that you can hold in your hand. You can invest in allocated accounts and unallocated accounts, uh, or you can also invest in the ETFs. So there's question with respect to some of the ETFs or the um, unallocated accounts is, well, is your metal actually there? It, there is an introduction of counterparty risk there. So can you expand on that? Uh, some things that our viewers should understand and consider before really putting their money into some account or ETF. In the most basic approach, there's a saying that if you don't hold it in your hand, you don't own it. By definition, when it's in your hand stored someplace for you uh, that's secure, preferably not in your home, um, you end up in a situation where you know it's yours. No one else has a counterclaim on it. The next step is to is to buy from a very trusted uh, metals dealer such as yourself. And there are several others out there as well, too. But make sure that you get it and you know that it's real. It's, it's, it's the real thing. It's not counterfeit. And you're not paying, you know, massively overpaying for it. You're not buying collector metals, things like that. And then the next thing is a lot of people, and I do some of this, I store some of my metal in al an allocated situation with my name on it. It's, in a, it's literally in a box, not a bank deposit box, but uh, a, a metal storage box at a secure facility with my name on it. It's not mixed with anyone else. Unallocated is, is when you have it uh, with other people. It might be uh, ounces of a thousand ounce bar. 
It might be metal that's mixed in with other people's uh, ounces. Uh, it could be a variety like that. And so preferably go for allocated when you can. There are unallocated uh, possibilities that, that are okay. But again, each time you move away from silver in your hand or gold, you have you move away from the reliability that you have. It's actually yours. Getting into ETFs, those are trading vehicles. And anyone who thinks they're going to get the metal from an ETF is going to be sorely disappointed. Most of them have uh, in, things in there that say they, they don't deliver or it's very expensive or you need a lot of metal to do it. It's not a cost-effective way. They're trading vehicles. And some of them just don't have all the metal. And they even have a situation where they say, we can pay out in paper money if we have to. So you don't even know that you, you're not even subject to getting metal at all if it suits their situation and they don't have it. So that's that's really the way you want to approach it, I believe. And another key thing is that taking delivery from some of these ETFs can be very difficult and really impractical when it comes to just the average person. You sometimes have to take delivery of millions of dollars worth of metal at a time. So really taking delivery is not an option for most people. That's really true, not a feasible option. And, and you know, market prices can change a lot during the time in which it takes to put this deal together for you. Another thing, too, which I really didn't think about too much until the last six months. I think it's for people that store internationally. People think about, well, let's store it at the, at the, in Australia, you know, at the Perth Mint, or let's store it in Singapore uh, so that you don't have uh, the, the uh, va value added tax, things like that. If you're trying to take delivery on that at some point, you could find out they could take several dollars an ounce to get your silver from Singapore or the Perth Mint. So, the, the cost can be very profound as opposed to buying it from a North American source. As I think most of our audience is, is in the Americas, Canada, you know, uh, Mexico, the United States, uh, Latin America. And so consider that, uh, you know, you have some of it where you can reach it for sure. And some of it, if you want to have it in a different jurisdiction, make sure it's not so far away that the cost of getting it to you almost obviates having it in the first place.